This was taken at Yale University in 2015, and it's Nicholas Christakis, who's a faculty member there and who was the master of the house along with his wife. Um, and this was the aftermath of an email that uh, Erica Christakis had sent out suggesting to students that they can they can come they can police themselves when it comes to what is or is not a uh, an offensive Halloween costume. This is all a kind of strange thing. But I I want to I want to play two clips. So this is from 2015 at Yale. Uh, where Nicholas Christakis, you know, a very highly esteemed professor, a baby boomer, uh, has gone out to talk to students. And let's watch this. For all students, do you understand that? As your position as master, it is your job to create a place of comfort and home for the students that live in Tillman. You have not done that. By sending out that email, that goes against your position as master. Do you understand that? Then no, I stop. don't agree with that. Then, then why the fuck did you accept the position? Because what I have the a fuck hired you? I have a different vision. You should you. step down. If that is what you think about being a master, you should step down. It is not about creating an intellectual space. It is not. All right. So, uh, Gene, let me ask you just when you, you know, and I'm sure you, I'm sure that this first made the rounds among faculty members at universities. Like when you see a confrontation like that, you know, with a professor on the receiving end of a, you know, a screaming tirade, you know, how did that make you feel? Well, I mean, I remember that time there was certainly a lot of discussion on campuses uh, among faculty members. Um, I mean, they really, oh, the only word to describe it was fear. There was, yeah. you know, it was this realization that what we thought the rules were, were no longer true, that we thought the rules were that the university is a place to have open discussion. And yes, we want to be respectful of each other. And yes, we want to be respectful of you know, people of different backgrounds, but we should be able to discuss things. Mm -hmm. And that was around the time that a lot of people started to become afraid that they would say one thing in class and get, and get fired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, has that uh, changed a bit uh, on campus for you, do you think? Has that Not really. receded a little bit? Yeah. No, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's pretty much still there. Can, and can I ask, does that, how does that affect the way, you know, not your research per se, because that takes place outside of the classroom, uh, mm -hmm. you know, although it's all connected, but how has that changed the way you teach? Um. It hasn't really changed the way that I teach, although I did start to think twice about, I mean, I, I teach psychology mm -hmm. and. I, so there's never people, anything controversial or touchy going on, right? In I your mean, class. right. Like, you know, yeah. and so I think I just had to go on, look, I'm going to present the research, do it respectfully, but I always tried to do that. So it didn't really, mm -hmm completely changed the, the way that, 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 that I did things, but it did, I did definitely, and I know I can speak for a lot of other people have had this experience too. It, it did have a chilling effect. It had mm -hmm. the effect of, um, being scared to talk about certain things of, um, of just worrying about it, of worrying about if this goes wrong, you know, what could happen? will my department back me up if we mm -hmm. have a discussion that goes sideways even because it's, these are types of things that happen so i think a, lo a lot of faculty members you know have watched those news stories coming out over and over and over and we pay a lot of attention to them because we try to figure out what went wrong and you know what sometimes you can take an object lesson out of the things that you read about other times you you, you just go man there but for the grace of god go i that that yeah. didn't happen in my class. I do. Uh, uh, a very uh, close friend of mine is an English professor, a, f a full professor, um, who is one of probably maybe half a dozen people who occasionally teaches Amari Baraka, a uh, black uh, poet and playwright and author. And in his work, he was uh, Leroy Jones in the, uh, for part of the 60s became Amari Baraka. Uh, his his work is filled with the N word, um, and and it's it is absolutely provocative. And one you know semester she was teaching a, a class in that, and a student, not even a student of color, objected 
And the response was, okay, well, I'm not going to teach Amari Barak anymore. And so you get yeah, this right. weird experience where it's like, you know, somebody who was on the, the margins of the, of the contemporary canon is now just not going to be taught, which I don't think mm -hmm. anybody would say, oh, that's, uh, it's an understandable outcome. It's not a good one. Liz, what, what were your undergraduate years from when to when? Uh, do I have to say? <laughs> yes. You know, well, we know um, you're a millennial and you're an older millennial and you're a mother. Uh, so two, it's like 2000 uh, yeah. to 2004. Yeah. Would you have ever in your life thought of screaming at a professor like that, even if they had like hit you with a baseball bat? No, but I do think that some of these trends were starting even back then. Like I got into yeah. a lot of fights in this one English class with um, this this woman who um, was upset about some things I said about about her like trend her her querying of my Antonia, uh, okay. and so she yeah. told the professor that I that I made her feel unsafe in class. And we had to both come into okay. his office and like discuss how I was making her feel unsafe. And that, that was the language right. used. So I think that this, it was definitely not as prevalent, but I think that this sort yeah. of, um, you know, language around like words, making people feel unsafe and ideas making people feel unsafe was, right. was starting to percolate even back then. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, Jean, when were you in grad school? Uh, in the 1990s. Yeah. And so, and, yeah, so that's when I started teaching. And I'll tell you, nobody ever said that. The idea yeah. of like, oh, we can't discuss this because it is unsafe. That was, yeah. nobody ever talked about that. That That is a very, that is a new concept. Yeah, that, and it's kind of fascinating. My grad school, I, I was an undergrad. So Liz, you are forever young in comparison to me. I was in undergrad from 81 to 85. I went to grad school in the late 80s through the early 90s. Uh, in an English department that was a hotbed of post-structural theory. And the idea of making people unsafe was kind of the whole point mm -hmm. uh, in lecture, you know, and that's why you would invoke various kinds of post-modern uh, or post-structural thinkers was to make everybody unsafe. And to their credit, the professors kind of gave as good as they got. They were, you know, um, uh, Gene, do you know when the rhetoric of safety or of, mm -hmm you know, that where an, uh, an invocation of me feeling unsafe became a thing. And is that related to one of your earlier books about narcissism? I'm curious. Um, I, I, it doesn't really follow the same trajectory as the changes in narcissism. I think it is more likely to be rooted in this, well, probably a combination of the slow life strategy and individualism. Mm hmm but with the slow life strategy, the slower development, parents tend to have the to make the choice to have fewer children and nurture them more carefully. So then right. you start emphasizing safety a lot more. Then kids take longer to grow up. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, one of the analyses I did for the book was to look in uh, the Google Books database, great resource, and you can look at the change in phrases like "stay safe." Right. Um, and didn't really change a lot till starts to go up you know, 1990. So these are things that really started with millennials in terms of mm -hmm. just a lot more protection, a lot more emphasis on safety. And then they kept going even more with, with Gen Z that um, it was kind of mission creep because at mm -hmm. first it was, let's protect kids from physical dangers. Then it became, let's protect kids from ever failing. And then it became, let's protect kids from ideas yeah. or teenagers or young adults mm -hmm. of, that safety is not just physical safety, it's emotional safety. It's, mm -hmm. I don't want to be uncomfortable. Uh, I don't want to be in the situation where someone else agrees with me. Um, and then it, then it wanders into the, the most controversial part of, you know, language and, you know, that that's offensive and, 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 um, you know, the, the places where I, I think a lot of people can agree to disagree where, you know, maybe we shouldn't have a KKK guy come to campus. That's kind of right. true. But then where do you draw that line? And who's right. to say that any of us is the one who knows where that line should be drawn? Yeah. Although, is it also fair to say, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking back to college in the 80s, there, you know, you would always have, um, uh, you know, every year, I, I went to Rutgers as an undergrad, and every year they had 
a different CIA, former CIA director come to talk to mm -hmm. campus. And every year they would be protested because they mm -hmm. were horrible human beings, some of them worse than others. But uh, but then they also had trolls, right? Like you would you would bring in speakers you knew were going to piss people off. Right. It seems like that's a more common thing. I mean, there's I think, you know, college campuses should be totally wide open uh, for all kinds of speakers. But when you invite somebody like Milo Yiannopoulos, he is not an intellectual. He has nothing no. meaningful to say, right. which became right. clear once. You know, once he was allowed to actually speak, um, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't really have anything interesting to no. say. But it's not simply, you know, that kids are snowflakes, right? It's also true that different parts of campus are like, let's bring in the most insane, ridiculous out there speaker. That's that might be part of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I really hate the whole the whole snowflakes label on on so many levels you know partially yeah. as a psychologist is like i think that's often used for people who actually actually have depression or real mental health issues and like yeah. man, let's not make fun of that okay um right. you know plus it is nuanced it is something where, we, where you know we're going to have a you know a wide spectrum of of opinions about this because yeah someone like milo is just a provocateur you know he's just trying to make people mad he doesn't actually have anything to say um, and, you know, so when people say that person or, you know, as I mentioned, like, you know, somebody who uh, is going to advocate for the KKK or something like that. Okay, that, mm -hmm. that's that's maybe in a different category. Yeah. Um, but then the idea of, you know, someone who is further to the right or further to the left shouldn't come to this campus and we shouldn't have a discussion where it is, you know, a, a more serious intellectual discussion of ideas. I think that's where most, most people, especially Gen Xers and Boomers, start to say, well, wait a second. Yeah. What are we doing here? Are we really going to say that we can't have these folks come to campus? And if they do, if you don't like it, don't go to the talk or go to yeah. the talk and ask challenging questions. We don't have to you know, disinvite them. We don't have to have a safe space where if you know th this offends you, you, you can go. There's right. other solutions to this. I think that's what a lot of Gen Xers and Boomers would argue anyway. That was an excerpt from my interview with Liz Nolan Brown of Reason and Gene Twangy, author most recently of Generations. If you want to see another excerpt, go here. And if you want to see the full conversation, go here. And make sure to come back every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time when Reason is talking to people with something very interesting to say that you definitely want to hear.